Today's interview is with a gentleman that Sports Illustrated dubbed one of the most accomplished, physically challenged athletes in the world. Roger Crawford is a living example that we all have the ability to achieve great success despite our obstacles. You may have seen Roger on Larry King Live, Good Morning America, and CNBC, as well as publications such as USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and Tennis Magazine. Roger is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, and in 2013 received the ITA Achievement Award by the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Today we talk about how to overcome challenges, cultivating a winning mindset, and what it's like to inspire tens of thousands of people per year to take action and overcome any obstacles in their way. So sit back and enjoy. Hello everyone. Today I am extremely excited to welcome Mr. Roger Crawford on the show today. Roger is a Hall of Fame athlete, keynote speaker, and author whose motivational and inspirational story has been featured on Good Morning America, Monday Night Football, The Today Show, and many more. Roger's best-selling books have been translated into 17 languages. Now, if all of that isn't incredible enough on its own, Roger has completed all of these incredible feats despite the apparent disadvantage of having four impaired limbs and was recognized as Sports Illustrated's one of the most accomplished physically challenged athletes in the world. So without any further ado, let's meet Mr. Crawford and discover what it takes to go from center court to center stage. Welcome to the show, Roger. Hey, thanks, Brandon. Great to be with you today. We're so glad to have you. Now, in your own words, if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, you, you talked a little bit about it in the introduction. I was uh, born with a physical challenge. It affects all four of my limbs from the elbows down and from the knees down. Um, I have two fingers on my left hand and one finger on my right hand. My, my youngest daughter explained it this way. She said, Daddy, uh, you were born to be an inspirational speaker. You got a peace sign in one hand, a thumbs up on the other. So I guess I was, you know, <laughs> born to be an inspirational speaker. But yeah, I, um, yeah, I grew up, was an athlete, played tennis and football. And, uh, you know, I was really fortunate growing up because I had parents that really instilled in me that uh, – uh, there were going to be no excuses. My dad used to have this uh, line. He used to say, Roger, you don't live in Pity City. And so I was fortunate to grow up with that kind of mindset, which I, I think is one of the reasons that I got involved in athletics. And I, I, I didn't want to be a quote unquote disabled athlete. You know, I wanted to be an athlete that happened to have a physical challenge. Yeah, I didn't want any special accommodations just because I was born a little bit differently. Gotcha. Yeah. You, you didn't want the asterisk. You just wanted to be in there with everyone else. And, exactly. and now yeah, that's well said. I've never thought about that way. I didn't want the asterisk. Yeah. That's a good way of, uh, of, of putting it now. So you played tennis and football. Were those your two main sports? Correct. It was. Yeah. But I, I mean, I love all sports, but those were the sports that I was competitive in really specifically tennis. I played mm -hmm. tennis in high school and then I went on to Loyola Marymount university in Los Angeles. Yeah. Now, as, as you were growing, I'm sure you had to come up against some people that said, you, you shouldn't be doing this, you can't be doing this. And I know you had that inspiration from your family, but how do you have your own mental mindset to kind of overcome people telling you you can't or shouldn't maybe? Mm -hmm. You know, great question. And so here's how I look at it. There's going to be a lot of people that tell you can't do it. You just have to make sure that person is not you, that you're not the one communicating that message. For me. I think it was number one, just, just a desire that I wanted to be like everyone else. In other words, um, I wanted to fit in. And so that was really, that really drove me. I think it's important for everybody listening that when somebody says you can't do it, what they're really saying is they can't do it. You know, it's about them, really not about you. And I think it's so important that you, you, you separate that. Also, the most important opinion is, the, is your own opinion of who you are and what you can become. So I always look at somebody rejecting me or telling me I can't do it. I, I look at that as kind of a fuel for motivation. The other thing is this. When, when there are people that tell you you can't do it, oftentimes that's proof that you're really trying to stretch yourself or do something important because people are taking notice. You know, if you're just going to shoot for mediocre, there's not going to be a lot of people that are going to say you can't do it, right? Right. It's only right. when you're trying to stretch yourself or challenge yourself. So in many ways, it's a good indication that, hey, you know, um, maybe I'm really uh, striving for something special. 
Yeah, you, if you if you shoot for greatness, you're always going to have some critics along the way. No and doubt. No you, doubt. You use that. Now, so then all throughout sporting, and then you were tennis throughout college, and you were right. pretty, pretty incredible from the research that I've done here. Yeah, well, thanks. Well, you know, I was pretty fortunate. I, I, I had quite a bit of success on the tennis court. And it's funny because people look at me and they think, you've got one leg. You've got half a foot, you've got three fingers, but you competed at a division one college level and you did pretty well. Now, how did that happen? And I think people are looking for maybe some complex answer or strategy, but Brandon, it was as simple as this. I learned that on the tennis court, if you can hit the ball over the net one more time than the other person, you win the point. And that principle is true in our lives as well about consistency about keeping that ball over the net one more time than your opponent. You know, oftentimes we shoot for perfection, right? But what really I think leads us to massive success, it's consistency. It's that consistent effort, that consistent execution over and over again. Look, there were limitations I had in the tennis court. I mean, no question about it. I mean, one of the fastest, one of the most powerful. But I, but I realized that if I could just be the most consistent, right, then I had the best chance of success. And I think that's really true in so many areas of our lives. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. You know, people think you can just kind of do a little of this and a little of that and right. follow what's flashy and hip and new and, and you're going to be at the top of the mountain. But it's really pushing that snowball uphill over and over and over. Absolutely. And, over. and then when There's you... There's no question. Yeah. And w once once you get to the top and... Everyone sees the snowball roll downhill, but they never saw that effort, the consistency, like you said, to, to get exactly. that. And, and, and to follow up even on that point, you know, once you get that snowball to the top of the mountain, you got to continue to push, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, because once you have success, repeating that success is sometimes easier than pushing it up the hill, you know. Absolutely. It's that consistency of effort, yeah. So now after, after tennis, how did you make the transition into, you know, the, the author, motivational speaker, everything, everything else that you've been doing? Right. It's interesting, Brandon, because I have a lot of young speakers that call me and say, gosh, you know, I've taken this course or that course on how to be a successful speaker. How did you do it? And, you know, it wasn't really my intent to be a speaker. I mean, I had done a little bit of speaking in high school and a little bit of speaking in college, but when I graduated, uh, NBC did a movie about my life called In a New Light, and that generated some speaking engagements. But I really learned on my feet. In other words, just, just being up in front of a number of groups over and over again. I gave a ton of free speeches. And I always say that my career started when somebody approached me and said, hey, what do you charge? And I said, huh, that's a pretty good idea. Maybe I should consider that. So that's how my career started. And... I approached it the same way that I approached tennis. And that was on the tennis court, you got to be prepared. You have to be prepared. You have to practice. Okay. So I learned that in speaking as well. I wanted to become the most effective communicator I could also realizing that I didn't want to rely only on my story. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, you know what, even if I didn't have a physical challenge, I could still be a speaker. And you know, I'm 57 years of age. I've been speaking full time since I was 23. Okay, that's a long time. Yeah, and I'm continuing to practice and work and, and, and try to get better. And I, I love that challenge. I mean, it's such a, such a privilege to do what I do. And, um, and I certainly don't take it for granted. You know, when I have when I'm on a podcast like this, I'm just so fortunate because it allows me hopefully to, you know, make a little bit of a difference in somebody's life. And let's face it, there's no no nothing greater than that. You know, when I look at success, people sometimes think it's think it's about prominence, right? But prominence is about us. I think long term success is more about significance and significance is about others. So I think the more that we can, can reach out and make a difference. I think that's a true mark of success. Yeah, the, the number of lives that we're able to impact in, in a positive way. Right. Now, for, for speaking and preparing, when you walk out on stage and you want to capture that attention right from moment one, 
in your opinion, what are some of the best ways that you've been able to really keep all eyes on you as you're up there, you know, without wandering through and Right. So let me tell you how I prepare my presentations. I prepare them in seven minute blocks, seven minute uh, vin vignettes. And then what I do is I move those seven minute blocks around depending on the audience. So, you know, if I'm doing an, you know, an hour keynote, I may use nine of those seven blocks. So each one I'm going to say are kind of mini speeches. So, but to specifically, um, answer your question. When I stand up on the stage, I want the audience to know that I understand who they are, I understand what they do, and I'm there to serve them. Mm -hmm. That is the way that you capture attention because here's what I always say to, 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 to speakers when they ask me about having a physical challenge. They say, well, you got a personal life story. Brandon, here's the thing. A personal life story helps you till you open your mouth. Okay, yeah. really, because people, the truth is, people don't care that much about my, my life story. They care about themselves, which I get, and they want something of value. So I need to be able to transcend, you know, my story and build a bridge. In other words, you know, I need to make my story their story. Right. So when I'm talking about mindset, right? I can't just talk about my mindset. I got to talk about how do we develop a positive mindset? How do we develop a winning mindset? How do we sustain success? How do we separate fear from anxiety? So I hope that answers your question. I mean, there, I think oftentimes I see this with young speakers is they begin a presentation by wanting to impress the audience or wanting to immediately gain credibility. But the way you gain credibility with an audience is, number one, that they understand that you've done your homework. You're not up there cold, right? You, you have prepared a message just for them. Now, that's not to say that I maybe haven't used this material in other places, but it's that I'm familiar enough with their pain points. I'm familiar enough with their, their, the changes they're experiencing that I can speak to them. Exactly. That's how you gain credibility. It's in my opinion. It's that level of empathy to, to understand and then the authenticity from your side to say, yes, I may be up here on stage, but the, it's, you're using terms like we and you, and it's not just the I, I, I story. Oh, no question about it. Yeah, you know, something I say in, my, uh, in a presentation, depending on the subject, if it's about, let's say, anxiety, right? I'll say, look. This is something that, that I struggle with in my own life. So actually today I, I'm speaking to myself and I'm, you all are just going to get to listen in. And, you know, they kind of chuckle because they say, hey, this guy, he's like me, right? He, he, he's, he's got issues and struggles just like mm -hmm. us. So, um, so those are the ways that I try to bid, build credibility. And, you know, I've done it a long time, Brandon. And the other thing that's really important is that the more you do it, you have to work really hard at keeping it fresh. Exactly. And I'm continually writing new material. And, and honestly, I'm writing more new material now than I did probably 10 years ago. And the reason being is audiences are a lot more sophisticated today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to walk into a company, people say, hey, we've never had a speaker before. <laughs> you know, I would be their first one. Wow. And it now, was only they, oh, we've had 50 or 60, right? So they've had a lot of exposure to a lot of great speakers. So how do you stand out? It's mm -hmm. by doing your homework. It's by being current, being topical. Uh, you just can't stop growing because when you stand in front of a group, you're very transparent. You can fake it for a short bit, but audiences figure it out. And them. if you're just up there telling a story and you're not living it, audiences sense it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I really like how you, how you said you break everything into seven minute blocks. And it reminded me, almost immediately of some interviews that I've watched of different comedians and they sort right. of do that same, there's like, if that section isn't working, you know, maybe it was in the middle of their presentation and they'll drop it right in the front and rework that to make sure that every section keeps attention. Every section is authentic and genuine. And I think, you know, whether it's a, a comedy performance where you're telling jokes or whether you're being authentic and getting that motivational message out, you have to make sure that every minute along the way keeps them engaged. There's no question. And I want to recommend 
a documentary called Comedian. Have you ever mm -hmm. seen it, Brandon? I have. It's incredible. Isn't that, I mean, it's brilliant. And I, I found that so compelling. And I, I recommend that to people who are, uh, want to be a speaker or are a speaker to look at how these great comedians break down their, the, the comedy lines and how they look at every single word mm -hmm. and that attention to detail just takes that performance to a whole nother level. If you want to be great on the speaking platform, you got to do the same thing. Patricia Fripp, who I know you've had on, the, on, on your program, who I just love, she gave me a suggestion a few years ago. Well, it's more than a few years ago that really, really helped. And she had me transcribe my speech. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that she trans and I went through line by line and looked at it and said, is this the best word for this story? I'm telling you, Brandon, it was yeah. amazing what it I uncovered. It makes such an incredible difference. Uh, yeah. I, I did a similar thing I used to, when I used to work on cruise ships. I would give an hour-long presentation. And when I started, you know, you go up there and you've got your bullet points of the things right. you can hit. And as my career went further and further, it got to the point where it was every word of every line, is this the most impactful thing that I can be saying with those minutes? Exactly. Exactly. And it makes it more relevant. The audience can remember it. And it has, it has greater impact. Yeah, I have a great respect for comedians. Um, I, I watch a lot of comedy, and I've learned a great deal from them. Um, and then, I, you know, I continue to watch speakers. And, and mm. it's amazing at, at my age, and I don't feel old at all, 57, but it's like the more that I feel that I've – the more that I learn – the more I realize I've got more to learn. Does that make sense? I, 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 totally words, it's like, I, can't, I think to myself, my gosh, you know, I, I've, I've spent so many hours doing this and studying it. And then I'll watch a speaker or, or, or a comedian. Wow. That's a great idea. Great technique. Or yeah. It's like a light bulb great, moment. Experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Now in, in all of your speeches for, for the last, you know, 20, 25 years that you've been doing this, do you have one particular performance that really stands out or maybe someone that you know that you impacted that really made a difference? Hmm. Well, there's been, there's been many uh, that I uh, think of, you know, it, it's hard to really pin down one specific speech, but hmm. I've had, I've had so many unique experiences of people that will approach me after a presentation and, and they will share a little bit of their story or their experience or letters that I receive. Um, I was in the first chicken soup for the soul book, mm -hmm. the very first one, which was, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, right? And in the back of the book, they had my contact information and Brandon, um, I would say that over a 20 year period, I probably received three or 4,000 letters. It's amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're so gratifying because it feels like, gosh, you know, you've, you, you, you've, you've mattered, you've made a difference. And, um, but yeah, here's one thing I'll, I'll tell you about an audience. I really cherish the opportunity because I think to myself, they're spending an hour, sometimes two hours, three hours of their day listening to me. I owe it to them to give them everything I've got. Mm -hmm. I never take it for granted. Um, people ask me, gosh, it's got to be stressful, right? Speaking. Because, you know, you got to travel, all the hassles of traveling, checking in and out of hotels. And my uh, response to it is always this, stress is a blank calendar. I agree. It's not traveling and speaking because anytime I hear somebody who's out doing what we do and they're complaining about traveling, I say, listen, uh, I've had times where the phone didn't ring. <laughs> I've stared at a blank calendar before. That is stress. Yeah. It's important to keep that in mind. Because audiences, audiences know that. I mean, they feel that if you really cherish it, cherish mm -hmm. that. I 100% I agree. And I love that you said, you know, you've got to be in that right mindset. Whether the phone is ringing or it's not ringing, you've got to keep moving forward, whether the situation is fantastic or whether it's kind of bleak at the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely.
And I think that that kind of transitions perfectly into one of your keynotes I was reading about, which is the winning mindset keynote. Right. And mm -hmm. if you don't mind, could you give, you know, maybe a couple tenements of what, what you talk about in that particular speech? Sure. So, yeah, one of the basic principles of a winning mindset is this. We very rarely, if ever, perform better than we believe we can. So therefore, really, our mindset um, really is the foundation for our success. Um, your belief system, what you believe is possible for you in your life, that really becomes the limit. That mm -hmm. becomes your ceiling. So if, if, you're, if you're struggling um, to reach the level of success you desire, one of the first things I think it's important for you to do is that you um, take a look at your mindset. Separating what you can change from what you can't. Look for areas of improvement. Look for ways that, that, that you can uh, grow and challenge yourself. Number two, it's on the idea of wisdom. You know, wisdom is defined as, I'm sorry about that, experience and reflection. So what that tells me is that our past, right, has a lot of valuable information and inspiration to draw from. Brandon, I know you've had this experience in your life after you've given a speech. You'll have somebody approach you and say, you know, I just don't have any self-confidence. I, I really haven't had any success. And you ask them, well, tell me a little bit about your past. And here's what they do. They underestimate, right, everything they've accomplished, and they overestimate all their setbacks and failures. Yeah. And what I want people to do is shift that mindset. You are much more powerful than oftentimes we give ourselves credit for. We are much more resilient. And oftentimes we, we, we let ourselves become defeated because of really insignificant obstacles. And if we just look at our past, we can see evidence of our courage and of our strengths. So we need to draw from that. The other thing about a winning mindset is having absolute clarity as to where you want to go. Now, look, every motivational speaker is going to say something like that, right? They're going to say, you got to be clear. But, but here's what I like to say to people. You cannot predict what's going to happen in the future, but you can prepare for the future. And one way you prepare for the future is being absolutely crystal clear as to what you want to accomplish. And I think you really need to spend time breaking that down into small increments because and you, you've seen this as well, and I know I've been guilty of this in my own life, you set goals and they're so broad, right, that you just can't wrap your arms around it. But think about how you can take those goals and break them down into small increments. You know, Tim Ferriss, uh, I'm a huge fan of Tim Ferriss. I've, I've never met him, but I got to tell you, I love his work. I think it's awesome. And he's got this line, you've probably heard it. He said, how would it look if it was easy? Have you heard him say this? Yeah, yes. It's brilliant, right? It is. Because it just totally shifts your mindset. Mm. How would it look if it was easy? And that's a great question. So that's another way of shifting your mindset. But again, it gets down to belief. Here's the other thing about a winning mindset. A few years ago, there were people that would say this. What you think about comes about, right? Mm -hmm. And... I think that that's partially true. I like to say it this way, what you think about and do something about has a good chance of coming about. In other words, it takes action and we get back to that consistent and it's consistent, massive action mm -hmm. every day. You've got to have a sense of urgency because life goes by quickly. And it's important that you make every day count. So that just gives you a couple of the, a couple of the ideas of a winning mindset. I think kind of the, the essence, if you distilled it down, it's really about what do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your capabilities? And if it's negative, if you are feeling that you're disadvantaged or quote unquote disabled, because here's a little caveat to this, Brandon, and I think you'll appreciate this being in the same work as I am. Um, when people say, do you ever speak to groups of disabled people? I say every group I speak to, <laughs> right? Yeah. The only difference is some are evident, some aren't, right? Yeah. We've, but the point is we've all got them. So 
just accept that and move forward. It, we're all going to have our limitations, but it's like, where are your strengths? Because everybody's unique. Everybody's got that ability within them to achieve their unique greatness. Everybody's got that. Because when someone says, oh, you know, am I gifted or am I talented? I always stop them and say, look, you don't need to ask that question. Because you are gifted, you are talented. The more important question, more profound question is how? Where right. am I gifted, right? It's not do I, it's where are they? What are they? It's, it's really being that introspective, asking yourself the questions that you've never asked yourself. Exactly. And, exactly. And Very I, well said. And I think the, the amazing thing about, you know, what we do and when you have that opportunity and when you're speaking to someone, that all it is is a light bulb moment for someone to realize it doesn't cost any money. It's not years of effort and pain. It's a simple shift and everything can go in a different direction in your life. There's, there's no question about it. You, you know, it, 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 your mindset doesn't necessarily change reality. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. but our mindset determines how we view what is. I love that. And I, I like that, you know, one of the very first things that you said was control what you can control. And yeah. it's something that so many people, they blame all these exterior factors on all these other things, and they don't take control of anything that they actually can. Right. Right. And, and here's what happens. Then what you do is you end up spinning your wheels because you're trying to control the uncontrollable and that leads to frustration. It leads to disappointment. Um, one, uh, um, I remember a few years back, they were talking about focus on your strengths, discover your strengths. Marcus Buckingham wrote a great book about that. And I, I, I really love the philosophy of that, which was, you know, don't spend a lot of time, right? Trying to improve your weaknesses because you can work as hard as you can and you're going to bring them up to mediocre. Identify what you're good at, your innate talents and skills and work on those and make those superior because people pay for superior. They don't pay for mediocre. I totally agree. And I, I found it really interesting when we started doing these types of things to, if someone can't come up with what they're really good at, all they have to do is ask someone near them or around them and they will immediately have answers of what you're great at that you've never even thought about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's like, for me, I always say, gosh, you know, when you got three fingers in one leg and I tried to be a concert pianist, I'd have been pretty frustrated. So it's, you know, for me, it was pretty evident what mm -hmm. I could do and what I couldn't do, but we all have those limitations. They just come in different forms. But I ask people, you know, don't spend a lot of time concentrating on that. What I want you to do is focus on your strengths, what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And see how you can take those to, to, to a level of greatness. And everybody has that within them. I totally agree. Now, with you, you went from speaking for a number of years, and then you wrote your first book. Is that correct? Right. So what, right. what was really the catalyst to go from speaking to writing? So two things. Number one, I realized that just giving a keynote speech or giving a seminar was fine, but I wanted to leave people with something they could take home. Mm -hmm. Number two, I started having a desire to speak uh, or uh, to write, excuse me. I got a desire to write because of speaking. And, um, you know, I wanted to write down my experience. So I wrote my autobiography called Playing from the Heart, which did pretty well and uh, kind of told my story. Uh, that book's been rewritten a few times now, so it's it's more of a motivational book than an than a autobiography. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that I looked at writing initially as a weakness. And I had to change my mindset about that because it actually wasn't a weakness. It was uh, I had in my own mind uh, – just used it as an excuse. So it wasn't, it wasn't all. So what I did was I pursued that and I um, became, you know, a pretty decent writer. And so I'm really proud of how I apologize for that phone. Um, so I, um, so I worked on my writing the same way that I did in my speaking. And so I've written three books and I've got a new one coming out and now I enjoy the process of writing, but here, but I want to be really clear on what I said is oftentimes what we think might be, a limitation 
I think it's important that we take a second look at it mm-hmm. because that what it actually might not be is a limitation, but it might be anxiety. And I just want to share this with you, Brandon, because I think that this is important. Um, I talk a lot in my speeches about fear versus anxiety. And I, I want to share this with, with your listeners because I, I've seen this really impact me in my own life. Fear is present based. Fear is tied to something real. The definition of fear is a reasonable and understandable response to our circumstances. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is you should face a little bit of fear on a frequent basis, because if you're leaving the known, right, entering into the unknown, you're going to face a bit of fear. But anxiety is fundamentally different than fear, Brandon. And, And here's the definition of anxiety, the anticipation of a negative event, whether it occurs or not. Okay. So in other words, it is anticipating that negative outcome without any evidence. There's nothing you can point to that says this is a probability, but in your own mind, you develop a mindset that something's negative going to happen to, to, despite my best efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's what happens. Anxiety is much more disabling than my hands or my legs. And anxiety can be a real dream killer for people. And the reason I brought that up is I wanted to be clear what I was talking about writing. For me, that was an anxiety. Mm-hmm. And once I understood that, I realized, you know, this is something I could be pretty good at. So I think it's important that we separate that fear from anxiety. I think that's, I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, that I love the way that you just broke it down by the definition of what each of them are, because people have convoluted ideas of, what they're fearful of or what is anxiety and why they have anxiety. And when you just look strictly at the definition, what right. is an eminent danger versus what potentially maybe could be. And this is the anxiety that's far more crippling in the long run. That's so well said, Brandon. And, and I, I think one question you need to ask yourself is uh, when you look at difference of between fear and anxiety, it's what's, what's the evidence Mm-hmm. What's the evidence that's supporting this anxiety? Is it real? Or ask yourself this question, is what you're experiencing anxiety about, is it out there or is it in here? Right. Got to separate the two, right? Absolutely. Because fear, it's out there, but anxiety, it's in here. And I have seen that in my own life. And, and I'm passionate about it, Brandon, because, I mean, I had some struggles with anxiety in my life. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, it... It, it is one of those self-imposed limitations. And you, know, you, you mentioned something earlier that I think was really important for listeners, and that was the idea of empathy. I think that's so crucial that we be empathetic uh, with our audiences, friends, family, and so forth. Because as human beings, we're all, you know, we all, we all get knocked down. We all have our own personal struggles. And I think it's important that we continue to go back to that. Um, and we remember that. I mean, when you're a speaker, you know, and you get the nice standing ovations and you get the great compliments afterwards, I mean, that's terrific. I mean, that is absolutely incredibly gratifying. You also have to put into perspective. And for me, I look at what I do as wanting to serve others, take my experiences, take what I've learned and share it with them. They may not remember anything I said, but they're going to remember what they heard and what they heard is way more important than what I said. Absolutely. Because it's how that message resonated and drove them to some action. Exactly. Gotcha. Now of your, of your books or where, if someone were to just, you know, all three of them are sitting next to each other, which one would you say someone should maybe start with? Yeah, now now you're asking me, like, who's my favorite kid? It's like, that's how I do, you know what I mean? (laughs) Um, I guess the book I'm probably most proud of is How High Can You Bounce? Okay. Uh, That book did really well and was very, very well received. Uh, And it's a book about how do you bounce forward? Mm -hmm. It's not about bouncing back, right? Right. I think it's about bouncing forward because people say, well, how do you bounce back from this or that? I say, you know, I don't, I don't really think you bounce back because you bounce and you're not the same because of the experience. And so you bounce forward because you have new knowledge, new insight and so forth. 
Um, I would say, how high can you bounce? I mean, that book has done done very well. It's been translated in a lot of different languages, and people have seemed to enjoy it. And I really liked writing it. It was a blast. So, and, and now you're working on another book, correct? Right. Called uh, Playing to Win, How to Decrease Excuses and Increase Results. Mm -hmm. And And again, it gets back to self-imposed limitations. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, Brandon, people say, why are you passionate about that? I'm passionate about it because having hands and legs like mine, certainly people could look at that as a disadvantage, right? Right. But what I will tell you, this is not nearly as limiting or disabling as a limited mindset. Mm -hmm. And it comes in the form of excuses. I don't have this. I don't have that. Right. Uh, The economy is against me. You know, you can find a myriad of excuses in life. What I want to encourage people is to find an excuse to succeed. Mm Mm-hmm. Find an excuse to be your best. To get to get there, take it out of pity city. Take it out of pity city, yeah. I, because I, having a physical challenge like mine, I mean, there's been some advantages to it. I mean, no question. I'll tell you one. It, 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 it toughens you up a little bit. Oh, I agree with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, when I was a kid, hey, keep, I'm 57 years old. When I went to school, there was no – I was the only disabled student in school. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a totally different world, right? And I, you know, I've had kids, you know, ridicule me. I've been rejected. I, but, you know, it gives you tough skin. And I don't really, I don't look back at, at all and regret that experience. In fact, I think it was really valuable mm-hmm. because there's not too many things that really tip me over where I feel like, oh, you know, I'm flat on my back. Now, that's not to say that there have been difficult times in my life where I've been discouraged. But you realize, gosh, you, you know, you can overcome things. You can bounce back. And so, and bounce back and then bounce forward once, once you had that, that mindset of what did I learn? What did I gain? How can I take what I learned and gain to move forward and be better, become more and do more? Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely love it. Now, outside of the book, what's, what's new in the Roger Crawford world? What's, what's upcoming? So you and I talked about this earlier, but I got to tell you something really cool that happened to me. I was speaking for Wilson Sporting Goods. And I was at their national meeting. And after I was finished, their engineering team approached me and said, Roger, um, we would like to explore the possibility of developing a tennis racket for you. Now, for the listeners, uh, I'll tell you how I hold on to a racket. I slip my right finger, which you can see here, in between the space uh, of a racket between the head and the grip. Hope that makes sense. So it's Mm -hmm. basically the middle of the racket, right? Then I hold the grip to my right elbow with my left hand. If anybody's curious, they can go on my website. There's a picture of me playing tennis and a video. Mm -hmm. So I went to their innovation lab and they took all these measurements and Brandon, here's what they did. They 3d printed a custom racket for me. How cool is that? Right. That's incredible. So, and I thought to myself, you know, there's not a big market for a dude with (laughs) three fingers, right? I mean, there's probably one person, maybe a few that can, would hold a tennis racket like mine. But so I've developed a great relationship with Wilson. I'm doing some speaking for them and I'm on their advisory staff. I have a new book coming out. I've been doing some work with the tennis channel. So life's good. Uh, I'm a grandfather. Uh, My granddaughter calls me pop daddy. So yeah. So I love being a grand grandfather and uh, my wife and I have four great kids and I've got an amazing wife and, and life's good. You know, I think it's important, Brandon, and I'm sure you talk about this in your presentation is uh, that attitude of gratitude, which some people think, you know, maybe that's a little, that's somewhat cliche. I don't think it's cliche at all. Um, I, I think for me every day, I'm so thankful to be blessed with my life, my family, you know, um, mm-hmm. I'm just so fortunate. And I think about that every day and it's just, I think it's one of the most powerful mindsets we can have. Just this, this idea of waking up every morning and just being grateful for what you have, you know? I, I cannot like echo that strongly enough because people get wrapped up. And I think part of the anxiety and the fear and the, the, about the unknown and stress of trying to be successful or trying to be something, and they're always looking forward at what they want or what they aspire. Right. That's important, but you have to 
like you said, be have gratitude for what you already have. The simple, easy, wonderful things that are in your life that are right. autopilot, that are so right. fantastic. Right. You know, your health, you know, your family, relationships, friends, all of that. I, I had someone say this to me years ago, and I thought it was such a great comment, is we were talking about money and financial success. And this person said, if you want to know how much money you need to be happy, here's the amount, a little bit more than what you have now. And I said, well, but you don't know what my financial situation is. It doesn't matter because it's always the same answer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that financial success is not important. Don't misunderstand me, Brandon. But if people look at that as the source of their happiness and contentment, they're always going to be disappointed. Yeah. They're always going to be. And I, mm -hmm. I, I see it's especially young people. And I know for me, I mean, I see this with my kids, right? You, you, that, that's how you identify success. And that's part of it. That's mm -hmm. part of it. But in my travels, I have met a number of very, very wealthy people. And what I will tell you is their happiness is not rooted in that. It's part of it. Yeah. You can't deny that. But if that is your benchmark, you're going to always be disappointed. Yep, because at the end of the day, although it does give you opportunities, it's just right. a number. It's just a number on a computer screen. It's a number on a computer screen, and if you have freedom and you have all the things that money can go with it, anything more than that, it's all great. I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to discount that financial that's part of success, yeah. but I see, I, I see this with with uh, a lot of young speakers that call me, you know, want me to help with their careers or whatever, and. And we say to them, look, you cannot use that as, as, your, as your benchmark for success because if you do, you're always going to be disappointed. You got to look at, you have to have other benchmarks, other measurements. Mm -hmm. Now, on, on the topic of success, what would you say are the top three skills for success today? Top three skills. Uh, I would say number one, adaptability. Um, it's looking at your life and realizing that what is normal today is not going to be normal tomorrow. The world's going to change. You got to adapt. You have to adjust and you have to be proactive. You, what was considered good five years ago today's is today is average. Mm -hmm. So one of the greatest risks that we have to success is standing still. Uh, yeah. So, Number one, it's gonna it's adaptability. Number two, it would be execution. Because Brandon, you you've experienced this in your life, I've experienced this in my life, and all the listeners have as well. Ideas are the easy part. Execution is the tough part. Everyone can dream. And, and as I look at speakers that I admire, business people that I admire, and I, I look at a common denominator, ability to execute mm -hmm. and execute fast. Yeah. Uh, because I was speaking for Apple and they had they said something that I thought was really, really profound. They said at Apple, we don't change with the times. They said by then it's too late. We change the times. I like that. It's powerful, huh? Oh yeah. yeah. That's not mine. That comes from Apple. But it's the same with ideas. Mm -hmm. It's a you can come up with an idea, you don't execute it quickly enough, there's gonna be someone else gonna have a better idea. <laughs> Yeah, so you got to do it quick. Uh, and the third, uh, third thing I think you need for success is that mindset, that positive belief system. Those are the, those are the skills that I really think are required today. Yeah, uh, because as I mentioned to you, I've been speaking a long time. When I got started. Uh, I remember you would send out a cassette tape. That's how you got speaking engagements. And now you look at how it is today. 
Mm-hmm. I remember being in a room with 300 people. You know, I'm sitting there in a, a room of speakers. You know, this is at a national meeting. And I'm sitting there as Tony Robbins here and Brian Tracy's here and Dennis Waitley's here. And, you know, I mean, we're all in a room. It's a little small group, right? And now it's just every, everything's changed. So you can, you can look at the past and say, oh, gosh, you know, I, I just wish it was going to go back to normal. It's- we don't go back to normal. No, the normal's ahead. Yeah. And you, that you got to, that mindset, you have to, you have to let that go mm-hmm. because if not, you're stuck, you're stuck. Life today moves at a faster pace than it used to. That's the reality. There's no use in denying what the reality is or denying what is, but there's so many, there's so many opportunities and great success. And uh, the thing I always tell people is look, when you start saying to yourself, I can't do it because you've got to really, really take a hard look at what you say next. Yep. Because someone can call you out on whatever the next words that come out of your mouth are going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think people say that sentence, I can't do it because, and they haven't even thought of what those next words are going to be. And they just, that's it. Out. That's it. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. And I love that. It's one of my, you know, one of the things that I love, I've done almost 40 of these interviews and I always ask, you know, what are the top three skills for success? And these are not things that are taught in school. They're not taught in college. No. They're not taught ever in life. But they're the things that really make the biggest and most impactful changes in someone's life. Right. No question about it. No question about it. Awesome. Now, to finish up, I've got a couple fun questions here. Uh, sure. To get to know you. Some, some rapid fire style. Okay. Now, outside of your own, do you have any favorite books or book recommendations? Oh, gosh. Book recommendations. Oh, so many. Um, gosh, I've really – Tim Ferriss has really <laughs> – really impressed me. I, I've, I've read everything that he's written mm-hmm. recently. Um, what did I, I, I reread uh, a book, a uh, book called Mindset, which I really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, there's been so many. I can look here. I just on my desk here. What, what am I reading currently? Uh, you Already Know How to Be Great by Alan Fine, which is a, a wonderful book. Mm-hmm. Another book I'd recommend to people is the inner game of tennis okay now, have you ever read it brandon i have not okay so the book is not about tennis i mean it is that's the backstory mm-hmm. but it's about a guy named dr tim galloway who came up with a new approach for motivation and continuous improvement and it's a fascinating book it was written probably 25 30 years ago it's a great read i highly recommend it awesome i will highly add it to the list yeah. I mean, reading, as you know, is just so crucial and it's something you have to be, uh, you have to be intentional about it. Yep. What, what are you, what are you putting in here? Right. Right. Brian Tracy, who's a dear friend. And I just, I have tons of respect for Brian Tracy. He told me this, he said, when you walk up on a stage, you always have to have four words in reserve for everyone you say. I like that. That's good, huh? I like that. All right, second second fun one. If you yep. could have dinner with anyone, past, present, future, fact or fiction, who would it be? Dinner with anyone. You know, I'd love to have dinner with my grandpa, who's no longer around. Mm-hmm. And I would love to talk to him about what the world's like today and get his input. He had a big big influence in my life. So I'd like to say, I'd say my grandpa, um, if it was somebody famous, who would it be? Abraham Lincoln. Gotcha. Awesome. I'd like Abraham. I just love to, I mean, I, I'm fascinated by his life. I'd love to just talk to him. Yeah. I've had such a disproportionate amount of people that have named family members for that question. And so it doesn't, it doesn't even surprise me at this point. Yeah. Now I know you've been an inspiration to many, but who do you see or who inspires you? Uh, I, the biggest inspiration in my life is my wife. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've known each other since we were in high school and she's just a really cool person. And I, um, I always say, gosh, I wish I was half the person she was, you know, or she is. And 
she just inspires me. She, she is the best uh, friend that I've ever uh, seen, not just to me, but to other people. She's somebody who is always making a difference in people's lives. And she's a really pretty amazing person, very disciplined, very, uh, I just admire her uh, immensely. People that inspire me are, uh, are ones that take their success to another level. And I get back to this idea of significance, just that really pour into others, that really have an impact. And someone asked me this question the other day, what do you want written on your tombstone? And I thought about it, and well, here it is. I'd rather be playing tennis. <laughs> That's what I want on mine, right? But as I thought about it further, Brad, I thought, gosh, I'd, I'd really like something on my tombstone that said, you know, Roger Crawford's life mattered a little bit. Mm -hmm. So. To be remembered. To, yeah, I mean, just to, yeah, just that your life was, um, you know, that it wasn't just about you. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you just... You did something that was was memorable or um, that had an impact on somebody's life, you know. So gotcha. Now, final question here. Yeah. Is there anything that you wish I had asked, or do you have any final words of wisdom? Well, I I can't really think of anything you haven't asked. It was really great, Ren, and I I just have uh, the utmost respect for you and what you're doing, and congratulations. And for the listeners, you may not know this, but uh, Brent and I share the same handicap. We're both from Cleveland. So uh, <laughs> now I now okay, that was a joke for anybody who's from Cleveland. And Brandon, <laughs> so you're you're that that was very tongue in cheek. I actually love Cleveland, and Brandon and I talked about this earlier, but. Um, you know, not really just, I hope that this time that we had together was, um, hope people enjoyed it. Hope they could take, apply it in their own lives. Um, they can, people can always visit my website. They can contact me through there, which is, uh, uh, rogercrawford.com. And if they'd ever want to get a hold of me, it'd be an honor to, to visit with you a bit. And, um, yeah, life's good. You know, I, I, um, feel very fortunate. I really do. And that's a wrap. What'd you think? Let me know the favorite thing that you learned in the comment section below. And if you know someone who could use a bit of inf information, a little inspiration, go ahead and send them a link to this video. And I've included links below to everything that you could need from Roger's world, his website, his books, his programs, and so much more. So if there's something that we talked about in the interview and you want to find it, Everything is in that description box. I've made it super easy for you. Also, click subscribe down there in the corner so that you never miss a video. Every Wednesday, we've got more expert interviews just like this one. We also have videos that come out on Monday and Friday, so three times a week, bringing the awesome straight to you. Don't forget our brand new course, Millennial Magnetism, shows you how to unleash your inner awesome and become a social rock star in only 10 minutes a day. Link below for the description there. And check us out, check us out on the web, lifesecretsauce.com, so that you you never miss anything new and we can deliver the awesome straight to your inbox. Until next time, ciao for now.